Hello and welcome to the Minds in the Frontline podcast, brought to you by the Frontline Strong Together 5 program. FST5 provides streamlined access to behavioral and mental health services, as well as crisis resources for Michigan's Frontline 5 workers and their families. This includes all professional, part-time and volunteer firefighters, EMS, law enforcement, corrections officers, and 911 dispatchers in Michigan and their immediate family members. First responders and mental health experts collaboratively created FST5 to provide 24-7 live support, effective resources, and cutting-edge services to prevent and alleviate PTSD, anxiety, depression, and other frontline work-related mental and behavioral health challenges. Need help now? If you are a frontline worker in Michigan or an immediate family member experiencing any crisis, work-related, substance abuse, depression, relationships, finances, or any other, reach out by calling 1-833-34-STRONG or go to fst5.org for more information. I'm Jeff Lassers, one of the hosts of the Minds on the Frontline podcast, and I'm a professional firefighter, paramedic, educator, and content creator. Minds on the Frontline is co-hosted by Mike Mattern, who is also a professional firefighter and paramedic. In addition, Mike is a peer support team member for his fire department and the Frontline Strong Together 5 program, a board member of the Michigan Crisis Response Association, and the former chair of the Michigan Professional Firefighters Union Behavioral Health Committee. Mike has training and experience with frontline worker mental and behavioral health. On the other hand, I do not. My role is to produce the show, whereas Mike is our resident subject matter expert. Together, we hope to inform, educate, and entertain frontline workers, their families, and the public regarding the realities of frontline work-related mental and behavioral health challenges. In this episode, we sit down with Brandon Evans, a firefighter, researcher, and founder of Fire to Light. With over a decade on the front lines, Brandon has first-hand experience with occupational stresses that first responders face. His struggles with mental health drove him to advocate for better support and resources within the firefighting community. Fire to Light was born from this mission, aiming to address mental health challenges through education, training, and proactive solutions. Brandon's goal is to inspire a shift in how all frontline agencies approach mental well-being, prioritizing it alongside operational and physical health. One of Brandon's key initiatives is Heroes Are Also Human, an international examination of mental health in the fire service and its impacts on the emotional well-being of firefighters. This international study, led by Brandon, involved over 100 fire chiefs across five continents. It revealed critical issues such as gaps in awareness, stigma, and the need for consistent support within the frontline communities. Additionally, it highlighted an imbalance in funding, with more resources directed toward reactive measures, like overtime, rather than to proactive measures such as mental health initiatives. The study calls for a cultural shift encouraging frontline leaders to build a more supportive environment for their personnel. Today, Brandon shares his journey from firefighting to leading groundbreaking research. He discusses the key insights from his study, bringing a blend of lived experience and evidence-based solutions to help frontline leaders, first responders, and advocates to improve mental health on the front lines. As always, we aim to provide a meaningful conversation that informs, educates, and inspires those on the front lines and their families. Please check us out on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook, and make sure to like and subscribe to all Minds of the Frontline podcast social media channels. Thank you, and enjoy the show. All right. Good morning, Brandon. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. Yeah, it's been a good morning. It looks like it, based on your background there. <laughs> looks like you're doing just fine. Have you been attacked by anything poisonous or deadly yet today? I almost I almost stepped on a poison dart frog uh, yesterday. Okay. Um, okay. There was a very small but very poisonous headless snake that we found on our porch that had been dropped by a bird yesterday morning. Okay, um, all right. And tell everybody inside, where you're inside at. Inside of that, I'm good. Uh, I'm I'm currently residing in Costa Rica. Amazing. Yes. And but you're a once Canadian firefighter, now researcher in Costa Rica, and that's what we're here to talk about today. But before we get into all that, who are you? What do you do? And where do you do it? 
I'm Brandon. I'm a father. I have two incredible children, uh, an amazing wife. Yeah. And I'm just someone who is very uh, passionate about life and living, living life to my fullest. And so I do that all over the place. We are avid travelers. Uh, I currently am living in Costa Rica with my children and my wife. We moved here a couple of years ago. Prior to that, uh, I spent close to 15 years in the fire service. So did some wildland firefighting, some volunteer firefighting. And then um, I spent over a decade as a professional firefighter in uh, for a large urban fire department in Canada. That's awesome. Everybody's story is a little bit different, but when and how did you realize that behavioral and mental health issues are real life concerns for frontline workers? I think it's like, it's a road, right? Like it's a, it's a journey. You pick on like little things here, little things there as a, as a firefighter, we start to gain confidence the longer we've been on, right? Confidence in our job, confidence on what we can say around the kitchen table. (laughs) Like it comes in all these different areas, right? Like we're taught to keep our mouth shut and our ears open. And and so we do that uh, for a long time. And so you start to pick up on things, you start to realize things. So we ran a call and I was probably two, two and a half years on and it was a car into a bus and they were, they, they thought the driver of the car was drunk and we got out of the car, ambulance, police were already on scene and two, uh, two medics passed us and or past me the second I stepped out of the truck. And um, I'm not putting judgment on anybody. I'm just, this is the experience, right? And one of them said to the other one, hey, did you grab the compassion? No, I left it in the truck. I don't think we'll need it for this call. And I was like, wow, that's a messed up thing to to say. You know, I didn't say anything because I was like, I'm still a rookie. I'm just like, ah, better, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. And we get to the call and, uh, you know, person was a type one diabetic. They were in a diabetic coma and there was a valid reason that they lost control of their car. And, you know, and it was uh, one of the firefighters on our crew who's also type one diabetic who recognized that, who had a sugar patch in his pocket and, and, and helped this individual. And so it was a wake up call for everyone on scene being like, oh, like he's not drunk. There's something, there's something life threatening that's happening right here. And so that was like, in my career, that was the first kind of like, huh, like, where are the hearts? You know what I mean? Like, why are there enough first responders that have this kind of attitude towards the scene? You know what I mean? This compassion fatigue, right? And so that kind of like, that kind of triggered me and opened my eyes. I've been into like, how can I improve me as a person? You know, it started with like, learning how to meditate. It started with that leading into like doing breath work. I remember when my daughter was born, she's 11 years old now, like sitting down and every morning at 5 a.m. because we were up at 4.30, 5 o'clock and, and, and practicing this Wim Hof breathing techniques like 11, 12 years ago, learning how to breathe, doing the ice baths, all that kind of stuff. And one thing just kind of led to the next. I was having, uh, I was suffering from insomnia. Meditation helped me get over insomnia and <laughs> The more I educated myself and learned about various things, I was also getting into entrepreneurship. My wife and I used to own a uh, a CrossFit gym. We lost that during COVID. That's maybe we'll talk about that later on. And all the stuff that I came across, like how do I run a great business? I was like, oh, I need to change as a person. I need to learn how to do these things to become someone who I'm not yet. And so the more I absorbed all that stuff. You know, the more confidence and experience I was gaining as a firefighter, the more we became aware of individuals going off on on, on psychological injury leaves, PTSD leaves, people going through substance abuse issues, through divorces, through all of these kinds of things. And we watch how that comes into the fire hall. You know, we watch the watching the bickering going on around the kitchen table, positive side and negative side. And the more I learned, the more I applied, the more I learned how to recognize myself when I was going through my own challenges. You know, I hit this, hit this moment in the middle of COVID, um, you know, where I went through my own critical incident stress. I just became a shitty parent, a a horrible person. I wasn't happy with who I was and yelling, screaming, uh, pushing my, my four-year-old, you know, swearing at him aggressively, um, and kind of take a look being like, the fuck am I doing right now? Like, this isn't, this isn't me. Where's this coming from? And so it was a long process. I know this is a long-winded answer to your question. Oh, it's good. No, Um, it's it's great. It's a long process. And we start reflecting on like, you know, mental health is is a topic. It's a hot topic now. It wasn't when I started, but it is now. And we said, well, what do we, what do we actually do? And how often 
have we done that? And what are we willing and not willing to talk about, especially from like the crew when I started to my crew and those moments, you know, those months before, before I left um, to go on a leave to start this research study. And there was a massive evolution that took place in terms of how we talked about it and the frequency in which we talked about it. And there was a lot of experiences on our own personal crew, traumatic experiences that happened that took place, some as a collective, some very individually, and then working through that together. And then seeing, just being aware of like, what are or aren't we doing? And how often are or aren't we doing anything in relation to the health of firefighters? And then you just see like a policy sit on the table and be like, oh, this is bullshit. <laughs> this doesn't, this policy, this doesn't yeah, reflect right. anything. This was right? in like a box. N- 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 yeah, not all it. of them. Not all of them. <laughs> yeah, right, but like, how often do we just see that there's a policy and we're so sick of like reading things we don't agree with or that seems silly or stupid it, it, for whatever reason? Yeah. Like, yeah. like I, I didn't even give it a chance. I just saw it. <laughs> right. And <laughs> and we're really good at firefighters. Like, this is bullshit. <laughs> right. Y'all are bullshit. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, like, whoa, something's changing. T-I-P-S. Right. Yeah. You should put that on a T-shirt. Right. Right? Like, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. like my, my deputy chief, um, or my old deputy chief, he switched departments now. We were talking about mental health. He's very supportive. He's deep, deep into this stuff. And he, we brought up, we were talking about this, talking about change. And so he's like, you know, it's so interesting dealing with, with firefighters. He goes, you know, we brought this, uh, we got new nozzles on our trucks, right? And the department spent two years researching, studying, trial and error of all kinds of nozzles. And he's like, I still got guys coming up to me being like, ah, these nozzles are horrible. We, we can't switch to those. Oh, why? Like, are you, what are you aware of that I'm not? Like, I would love to, I would love to read whatever, whatever you're reading. Well, they're just not good. Well, based on what? Well, because the ones we have are the best. And like zero research, zero effort yeah, yeah. went into simply like, I don't want to change. <laughs> right? I don't, I don't want to change and adapt. So we're really, we're really good at that as <laughs> You think firemen hate right? change and things staying the same. Yeah, yeah. right, right. <laughs> totally, totally. With, with no reason other than, well, that's what we've always used. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, no, that was a very rich answer. I think we, we, you hit that nail on the head. And I think that strikes a chord with, I think a lot of people listening and they can all empathize with that. Not just sympathize, but truly empathize with the, your feelings on that. So how do you go from the gig of professional firefighter up in Brampton, Canada, by the way, center of the greatest hockey players in the world come from there. <laughs> there, there you go. But how do you go from working up there to being a researcher? Like how do you down in Costa that, Rica? Well, yeah, that's the location. It yes. almost doesn't matter. That's just where his heart found him, right? He can do his research from Manitoba if he needed to, but he's not. So, but so how did you, how do you go from the firehouse to the research lab for lack of a better term? Uh, short answer, I think is like just being open to like that one thing is going to lead to the next and not knowing what that is, but something, something is going to come. And so how did it happen? My wife and I over the last five, seven years have made and been in the positions where we've had to make a a lot of real difficult decisions. And so the more difficult decisions you have to make, the easier they become in a sense. Um, And so it's not an easy question. You know, it was and wasn't kind of in the plan, you know. Like I mentioned earlier, my wife and I had started a gym. So that's a big decision, a massive investment that we took in a, in a, in a whatever popular commercial mall to open this, open this facility. We were open for 18 months before COVID hit. And then we just started to like make a little bit of money in January, 2020. And then COVID hits where we lived. We were closed for almost two years. That's how long the gym was closed for. We lost an awful lot of hundreds of thousands of dollars that were gone and COVID was rough for everyone on all the fronts. Uh, for us, it also looked like a lot of financial burden, having employees who we felt responsible for and wanted to help. You know, we had rent increases twice throughout COVID <laughs> through these huge uh, greedy landlords. So our hands were kind of tied. And at the end of it, we went through one more lockdown. We've been open for six months. Another lockdown was approaching us. I have a a really good friend of mine uh, who's mentored me um, in a spiritual sense 
we have amazing conversations we, we meet frequently and we just kind of like talk like how do we articulate that side of ourselves that we can't see that we can't touch that we know exists that sixth sense whatever you want to call it right and so we had a lot of conversations and financially on paper the gym was like it was a disaster it was it was going to take me years to get back 18 months is what we predicted based on being open for those six months that would take us back to break even and i probably had to put another 50 grand into the thing just to be able to to upkeep throughout that 18 months and you just went through one of the hardest times in known history we, yep. we just went through one of the hardest times in history in december of 2020 i was i was my, my crew responded to a homicide and that scene really just brought everything to the surface for me. All the things from what was happening outside of the fire hall to all the trauma that I may or may not have dealt with inside the fire hall. It was the first time that I'd had someone else's skin all over all over my body. And I came home from that. I didn't want to share anything with my wife. My kids were little. They're like seven and four years old, something like that. So I'm not talking to them about, about what, what daddy just did. And then uh, they announced another lockdown. So I'm, I'm, an, I'm answering phone call after phone call of members canceling their gym memberships, right? And, and to me, I'm just like, oh my God, like how much longer is this thing going to go on? We were just closed for six months, open for a couple. Now we're going back into another, another lockdown. They're already telling us this is probably going to be longer than the last lockdown. And so this is when like this eruption happened where I'm like, I'm yelling and swearing at my son when he walks into the room, pushing him out of my office. He falls down. I'm just like, the fuck did I just do? My wife looks at me. She's like, you need help. And so I got on the train like right away. I booked a session with my breathwork practitioner. I booked a session doing uh, neuro-linguistic programming and all these things. I talked to a therapist. All these things kind of happened where, where we are, our schedule. We Once a month, we have seven days off on our 24-hour shift schedule. And so got off shift on Thursday and then our seven days off starts. This is where all the big fires come on, right? Right before you have to go home and deal with your family. Mm -hmm. um, yep. <laughs> and so all those things, <laughs> all those things happen. I mean, the year before that weren't great. The two years before that, you know, I'm stressed trying to start run a business. I'm not home that much because I'm, I'm running this gym and I'm being a full-time firefighter. So you're like trying to juggle life, thinking you can do it all, trying to keep everybody else's spirits up doing whatever I can to get by COVID comes and I'm just trying to control everything and keep up with everyone trying to keep friends relationships happening you know what I mean all of these things and then you know shit hit the fan and I just couldn't hold on I couldn't hold on anymore I'm like what Getters full. what what can I actually control? And there's all these things. I'm like, wow, I can't actually control these things, but I can surrender to them. I can start how can I listen to something a little bit differently? And so, yeah, it was like, it was a quick turnaround. I shouldn't say turnaround. It was, it was, I was quick to recognize, like, I need to do something. And willing. And, and, and willing. Yeah. It, you so to like, do to, it and then you did it. There's a big difference. A lot of people can't do the face it and do it part. But it sounded like you already had good coping skills. You were just so damn overwhelmed that it, you're, you're bailing water off the Titanic here. I mean, you can't keep up with it. I really believe after, you know, going through what I went through that we all go over the waterfall at some point. It looks a little bit differently, feels a little bit differently. It acts a little bit differently. You know, it's not the same for any of us. My experience and your experience are not comparable, right? You know, I, you know, I wasn't suicidal. Others are. Mm -hmm. You can't compare those things. One on the surface to me may seem worse than the other one. However, I'm still living my own experience doing that own thing, right? As we all are. 17 years ago, before I became a firefighter, I went backpacking around the world. And it was a time when I just like didn't know where I would be next. And I just kind of showed up to the next place. Found myself in India. I love hiking. Went to the Himalayas. And I found myself, I don't know what it was, right place, right time, in a room for three days, listening to the Dalai Lama. He was hosting a teaching and it was I don't know even know how it happened, but I showed up. And so this was like a pivotal moment in my life, going from like young 20s, party mode, all that kind of stuff to like, huh, this is really interesting. How can I learn more about me, right? Not about Buddhism, just about, about myself as a human being. And that's when I started meditating. And so the more I learned about myself, 
the more I wanted to learn about myself. And I, that comes along with like more acceptance, more forgiveness, more curiosity about what else can I learn? Who else am I? Like what, what more is there to me that I've been unaware of, right? Especially as a young man, uh, actively playing hockey as a kid, all this stuff. It's like the ego is strong. You're like moving moving out of this invincibility stage, right? Like, oh, who wants to ride their bike off that cliff? Hopefully we'll land in the water. Yeah, sure. I'll do that. What's the worst that can happen? Oh, yeah. And those things are so good for you as a young man growing up and then you don't shed some of it and it's like you don't, you can't let things in with it. It's like mm. we need yeah. warrior poets as much as we need poet warriors and that's kind mm. of where, you know, yeah. where you're going. So like, but I know I feel but how, how, do we, how do we balance those things? And so um, I started diving into it and what I learned looking back on, on my experience. So for one year, year and a half after that experience with this homicide, there was like a lot of really intense, deep inner work that took place. A lot of conversations with a lot of practitioners and therapists, uh, psilocybin ceremony, all kinds of things. The more I learned, the more I wanted to learn. It was the same process again, just taking this deep inner look. I got me thinking of like, you know, I have other friends, colleagues who have been off. Some of those people are still off on PTSD leaves. Some of them went off and have never returned and will never return to the job. Other ones came back and went through their own post-traumatic breakthroughs, right? And so I started questioning, like, why? Why did I do this step? Why are others not doing it? How come there's those who I know and I love who aren't taking any action or doesn't, I don't think they are anyways. They're not talking to therapists, they're not doing these things, even though they know there's this disruption happening within their life. And so I look back and I was like, wow, there was a lot to being prepared for that critical instant stress for the waterfall. Like the waterfall happened, it showed up unexpectedly. It was like, I got it, I got it, I got it. Oh shit, it's right there. And I can't pedal backwards. I can't get to shore. I'm going over it. Got to ride it out now. Now you got to ride it out. And so I, I found that I was fortunate that when I got to the bottom of it, I had a life jacket, I had a toolbox, I had tools, I knew how to use them. And then I took action on using those tools. And so going through that process really made me take a deeper look into what are we doing in the fire service? We hear about things, we hear about statistics. We think we know that mental health comes up more and more and more. We watched everybody go through it, at least on our own crews during COVID, because it was just a it was a wild experience being a first responder during COVID, especially in a place where we had like some of the most intense lockdowns in the world, not just in Canada. But, yeah, like, we had some in, pretty, in, world. It was in pretty Michigan, we had some pretty, yeah, and I, you guys had it much more stringent than we did. Yeah. And we were pretty locked down and you guys were like real locked down. <laughs> I think the saving great. I mean, we at least got to go to work. And interact with other. That was people the thing is some person. people got to work and they're they're like not even in the same rooms. So now you're going to work, you're right. only seeing people on calls because you're segregating each other. And it, it was the like isolation weird. was oh, not good for a lot of people. It was deafening. Yeah. It was this yes. silent, deafening thing. It was crazy. Yep. Okay, so it sounds like you found this deep thirst for information, and it led to the heroes are also human study. What is the study? One thing leads to the next. I end up closing my gym. I take some time to myself. And this idea pops up of like, hmm, what do I know? What am I good at? What's happening in the fire service? And what are we missing? It was clear that, that, that we weren't doing a lot of training, education around mental health. And the recognition of like, that preparedness side of things, of preparing for the psychological side of our job, I wasn't initially fully aware that that's what I was doing. Um, but it, that came into my awareness of like, huh, like I, I, I was, I was prepared. I was prepared to say yes that I need help to recognize like something is wrong. And so, I was like, what if I could create a mental fitness program for firefighters that helped us prepare for the psychological side of our job? And then the next thought was like, well. I can't just go off of my only soul experience. I need to gather more information. And so I just wanted to know what's the current state of mental health in the fire service. And, and I dove in, I consulted with the psychologist. We drafted the questions. I didn't want to come from a 
not a psychologist, so I wanted this to be from my experience as a firefighter interviewing other people with lived experience. I wanted to talk to the decision makers, the people at the top who make the decisions, who implement policy, who allow for specific types of training to and not to happen. And I wanted to get an idea from them as to where are your fire departments at and how do you think, feel, act? react to mental health and who's doing what? Like, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's just my department. Maybe it's just my crew. Maybe it's just a little, the little bubble that I know. And so that's how the study started. I just, I dove in. I thought I would interview, if I got lucky, around 20 or so chiefs and leaders, primarily in Canada, in Ontario. If I got lucky, maybe I'd hit a couple in, in the States. And that kind of snowballed into over a uh, hundred fire chiefs from five different continents who represent more than 1.3 million firefighters globally. That's, I would say that's a good sample size. It's also a good place to start. Yeah. Call the yeah. chiefs and say, Hey, what's going on? Yeah. So <laughs> and that's, so you, that, that's literally what I did. So you, you reach out to all these chiefs, you reach out to all these different departments across the world. What are some of the things that you learned from this study? A lot uh, that most of us are doing the same thing. Um, there's a, there's there's definitely more similarities than there are differences. In the, learn, the impact, or like it, or what they're that. doing, or, what, oh, what everybody's doing for it, or when you say this, yeah. Story. So when it when it comes to well, and come from different different places. So when it comes to like how we train our firefighters, at least the frequency of what we train, similarity over eighty six percent of the departments that we interviewed only train in mental health programs one to two times in a firefighter's career. Yeah, say that again. Not even once a year. Once in a career. <laughs> yes. In a, in a career, in a 25-year career, over 86% of departments only train one to two times. That's something that could kill you. Yeah. So the, the conversation comes up, from, well, well, what is training, right? We looked at specific hands-on in-classroom training. This doesn't include things like signage, doesn't include emails, doesn't include conversations around the halls. There's a lot of other initi initiatives that I would include in training. For us, it was, what can I measure? <laughs> what can I count? Right. Yep. Um, we learned that there's a lot of fire departments who are really focused on on measuring the statistics around mental health and the inability to do that because of, you know, there are all these privacy issues that come up. Right. And so the focus became on, well, why would I invest money in something that I can't I can't gauge? I can't learn from. I don't know if it's going to work or not. On the other hand, there's a group of individuals and departments who don't care. They just say, we want to help. We understand. I think that this program we bring in is going to help somebody. And so let's do that. And can we adopt more programs? Because the more programs, training, education that we bring in, they're all going to reach someone. We're all different. We all absorb things differently. And so some departments do that. They don't focus on how do we measure this now? And so some that we have determined perhaps are leading the charge when it comes to mental health in terms of everything, uh, frequency, volume, in terms of how their department has seen an incredible amount of improvement of mental health for their firefighters over the last five or 10 years. And these just come from both the quantitative and qualitative information that we collected from our research. It's like a... It's not a pinpoint thing. You know, there's limitations to what I'm saying, obviously. However, you get the general idea, the feel from these leaders of like where they were to where they are now. And they're like, they're like, we've seen an incredible improvement in the health of our firefighters. They're coming to work. They're staying at work. They're coming off leave quicker. They're not staying off on leave all the time. So there's all these, all these factors that build up. Yeah, there's certainly things you could correlate from instituting mental health things and people taking less time off from work mm -hmm. with their sick time. We want people to use their, use all your vacation time. Use it. At, you will have fun, man. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I hate to see it when guys use sick time because they need it. You they know need what it, I mean? They need those mental health days where they just can't come to work. Right. And when you yeah. get So like when somebody says you can, you can't measure it. It's like, I think you can infer. <laughs> you can see a lot sure. of things in there. So yeah, please keep going. So what we have now is there's a couple of departments who have had a very aggressive approach to developing their wellness programs over the last 10 to 12-ish years. And so now separate departments are looking backwards to be like, okay, what do we do? How do we do it? What's in place? 
Now we can look back to better determine what is or isn't working. So now they're looking at, okay, how do we measure this thing? And this potentially in the future could really benefit lots of fire departments. And your fire department is different than mine, is different than that person's, and is different than that person's, right? There's similarities in our cultures and there's vast differences. You know, you look in the States, from state to state, from in Canada, from province to province, there's a bunch of laws that can happen in one place, but things can't happen in another place. So how do we get creative enough to develop what works for us, where we live, who we are, the culture of our department? So it's an interesting thing. It isn't as simple as use this hose, it's better, and this is why it's better, <laughs> right? I think our minds go to that, right? All we've done is, is measure our equipment. We put right. things on scales so much that we need a measurement to tell us who won. Right. Right. And, and we need and, something. Yeah. You can't really do it. When you, and it feels like what you're saying is you got to take in all this information and have the critical thinking skills to then look at how you, your department is affected and then what resources does it need right now? And then what do I need to invest in as we move forward? So that's a really interesting word. Most, I shouldn't say, how do I say this? A lot of conversation is around costs and budgets. Oh, if I only had the money. Oh, God, I hate that. You, we've, you seen examples of, we've seen examples of fire departments in the same state, different towns, very different budgets, who are both in very similar places in terms of how they've managed, dealt with, implemented these strategies. Right. And so it isn't always about the money. Money plays a role. So this was said to me uh, by a friend years ago. We're having a conversation. He's like, what if everything in your life, you looked at it as an investment, not as a cost? Oh my God, my groceries are so expensive. Whoa, yo, look at what I'm eating. I'm eating these grass-fed beef and uh, super healthy, organic, all this stuff, whatever it was, right? Um, but every single thing, it's like, just flip the switch on it. How can you flip the switch on how we're thinking and feeling and reacting around anything. So if we're now looking at an investment, it changes the game, right? And there's a lot of leaders that are investing heavily, not just financially, from every stretch into the health of their fire departments, knowing that they're going to be gone real soon. What can we put in place now from my heart that I know is going to help so that hopefully it will still remain to improve the lives of the people that I love, right? And then they're going to be gone. This is the challenge with governments, right? We put things in place. You're only there for so long and then, whoop, see you later. But yeah, we're the next person. The next person is not yeah. important to them. Yeah. And we all want to leave our legacy. We all want to leave a piece, all of these things. How are we investing in the health of our firefighters? And if we are not making health a priority, this ain't rocket science. It right. does not become a priority. Right, right. It's like, it's so easy for things. To, how many times did a project not get finished in your firehouse? With all the best intentions. Hey, we could do this, we could do that. And then you get after it and you're like, it never got done. And they're like, yep. half the crap's in the corner. Nobody built the thing or whatever the idea was, right? It's yeah. almost like that sometimes. I think you hit the nail on the head when you're talking about investing in your people. It improves everything. Every aspect of your department will improve if you put the money, put the effort, put whatever you want to do towards improving those employees' health and wellness. Yeah. Yeah. You'll see you'll see returns in every aspect of your department. You're going to want to come to work. That's it. You, they want to come to work. They're happy. You're going to get more production out of them. And unfortunately, let's just talk about it, dollars and cents you may put a little bit of an investment up front to take care of your people. It's going to catch you on the back end. You're going to save money by all the overtime that you're going to have to put out there, the sick time use, the, you know, if, if you have a problem with sick time use, you should probably start looking at the wellness of your employees. hundred percent. I can almost 100%. guarantee you if you're having a sick time problem at your department, it's probably because your employees need to get taken care of. Yeah. They're not happy within their organization not, and they could give a fuck to be there. Exactly. If you've if you've got the sore back, right? But you know you go to work and you're going to be supported. You're going to go. Yeah, you know what? I think I can. I think I can do it today. But if you think you're going to go to work and it's just going to be that dark, dank place where no one gives a shit about you with that sore back, you're going to go. Yeah, I'm going to call in today. They don't care about me. I'm a number. And I think departments have to realize that in cities and and whatever wherever place you work, 
I can't stress it enough. You take care of your people, they're going to show up for you. And it's not rocket science. So if you're looking at and you're going, wow, we might have a, a sick time issue here. Why don't people want to come to work? Well, you can probably fix that pretty quick if you just take care of them and implement these different, these, you know, programs or whatever it may be. And the other thing you said was all the, all the head people running these things, you can do this stuff on a $0 budget. If you There's can, a lot of things you can do. There is a ton of stuff that you can do that doesn't cost a lot of money, yep. you know? And if you're using money as to hide behind of why you're not doing this, that's just an excuse at this point. You can find money to, to do a lot of projects. You know it's what I'm all saying? what you make of it. Yeah. It's like anything else. It's what you actually make of it. A lot of this can be lip service when people start going on the roads of the money and this and that. But give us some more of the key things that you learned from the study. This could yep. probably be revealing, I, I'm sure. So what other key things would be of interest? I'll just run a bunch of stuff out for you. Perfect. Up, um, yeah, go ahead. Let it roll. I'm sure you've done this once or twice. So hit us with <laughs> three of the uh, major challenges we're seeing when it comes to mental health of firefighters are a lack of trust, a lack of understanding and acceptance of mental health, and humanity, right? I don't have to say a lack of humanity, but humanity is woven through all that we do. So that's the reason why the report is titled Heroes Are Also Human. Right. You're saying like just seeing that the the person in that uniform is let's all not your forget, person that's a first. Person. That's are a, we focusing on the uniform or the person behind the uniform? Uh, yeah, any absolutely. department, I don't care who you are, where you're at, any department, look at all of your policies and procedures. Which of those policy and procedures speak to the uniform? Which speak to the person behind the uniform? And what does that treatment look like? How do we discipline? Do we discipline the person? Do we discipline the uniform? What does that look like? You know, who's disciplining who? So there, it's woven throughout all of the things. We looked at what we spend on mental health and wellness. And then something else that surfaced for us was what departments were spending on overtime. And so I started to see a correlation here. So on average, this is a global perspective. On average, we spend 0.7% of our overall operating budget on entire everything we do for health and wellness. So entire divisions. On average, we spend 3.8% of our overall operating budget on overtime. So we spend 438% more on overtime than we do on health and wellness. Okay, great. So why do we do that? At first glance, I was like, what if you spent just a couple percentage points more? Like, what if you, what if it was 430% <laughs> you took a little bit more and right. dumped it into wellness? How would that, or new fire equipment, bunker gear, fire trucks, wherever those areas that you're saying, we don't have personnel, we don't have enough money. And so what is overtime, right? We have like, we're contracted to work a certain amount of hours per week, per month, per year, whatever it might be. Now, I am understanding there's a hundred different ways that departments use and leverage overtime. But I was looking at, well, what is the impact of overtime? We are seeing an increase in call volume. Our study showed that 64% of the departments that we're interviewing are seeing an increase of firefighters going on leave. The majority of those are seeing psychological injury starting to surpass that of muscular skeletal or physical injury for the reason those firefighters are going off on leave. If you're in health in any capacity in the fire service, you know that sleep deprivation is a massive topic right now because of shift work. In 2007, 2009, something like that, the World Health Organization deemed shift work a carcinogen because it's so detrimental to our health. Okay, this is from, yes. this is from the World Health Organization, Absolutely. right? No, I remember yes. that now, but it's like, it's so interesting to like repurpose that word for that, but it's appropriate, yeah. And yeah. so, you know, we looked at this in the comparison of where we spend. We have an example of a fire department that overspent on their overtime budget in a single year by almost 1,500%. That's a lot of money that we claimed we didn't have that we ended up spending because we feel we need to, right? We want to keep fire trucks open. We want to keep firefighters in those fire trucks. We want to keep our firehouses open. I get it. And... We said we didn't have the money and now we're spending it. So what are we prioritizing? What efforts are we going to, to minimize? And in my own personal experience without ever being a chief. So again, maybe some limitations here. I've not sat in that role. I understand there's an incredible amount of pressure coming from all of these angles. I'm not just trying to be an armchair quarterback of a firefighter being like, you should do this, you idiots, blah, 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 blah. However, when we look at the health of our firefighters, we are knowing that we are putting them into situations more frequently by overtime. They're 
now we know they're going to, in most places, they're going to more calls than they used to go to. So we are dramatically increasing their exposure to traumatic events. Yes, they signed up for this job, but now we're putting them in these positions. So the average first responder will respond to between three to 600 traumatic events within their career. The average person of the general population will only experience between three to four traumatic events in their lifetime. Give us a little context of traumatic event, just so people understand. Uh, a car accident, doing CPR on somebody, going to walking downstairs in a basement when you think you're responding to a, a, a medical call for difficulty breathing and, and uh, someone's 16-year-old son is, is has hung himself in their basement and you have to respond to that. Going to a house fire where there's no casualties, but everyone's on the front lawn and it's fully involved and they've lost all their items and you now have to deal with the people in that house. Going to another call where the parents are on the front lawn and there's three dead children inside the house. These are traumatic events, right? So that word means different things to different people. The same crew can show up to that house fire where there are casualties. One person walks away having that never impact them and somebody else, it does impact them, right? We're impacted because of and again, not a psychologist, but we were impacted because of our entire experiences in our life. And we become triggered by something in relation to something else that has happened to us. And so now we take that home. The event ends. We can't avoid that event. The event happens. And now we're left to our own devices. So what tools do we have to manage that, to deal with it, to mitigate it? And so those are the traumatic events and they're becoming more frequent to firefighters. We know that we are seeing mandatory overtime lists that departments are starting to use. So now we're saying you have to go to work. We're now forcing you in some capacity. This is used differently in different departments, but we are forcing firefighters to go to work because we don't have extra funding to hire firefighters because we're seeing an increase of our firefighters going on leave. And we're not able, most departments, to hire new personnel for those who are off on extended leave. So now we're paying time and a half for those people to be off. We're trying to hire new firefighters to come into play. I don't know what the next step is after mandatory overtime lists. It's going to look something like shutting down fire trucks, shutting down fire holes. What's that going to look like for our communities and the people it's and our, our hearts? Number nine one one. Yeah, you're, you're just it's that's going to right. Decrease the responses. Yep, you're putting and decrease more our our there. response time. Right, yep. it's going to decrease our response time, and people are going to die. And who's going to be impacted? The fire, the, the individuals, the citizens, sure. and the firefighters going to say, fuck, it took us 20 minutes to come to this call. We used to respond in five. We had to go to some other difficulty breathing call. And now this person's died because we didn't respond quick enough. Yes. Yeah, and every day you're eating just, it's like death by a thousand cuts sometimes in these situations. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, it's not that bad. And everybody keeps telling me it's not that bad. It's not that, and I'm, I'm saying that facetiously. I'm not saying I'm going through this situation, but I've seen this play out where you just keep taking these light blows on the chin every single day, whether it's your equipment, the number of calls, the fact that this facility is abusing your services. There's all these different variables that just eat at you. And then they're like, oh, you have to come in today. It's like, no. Well, no, you have to. The contract says you do. And so now not only do I not want to be there, you're forcing me there. I'm not going to have a good attitude. Yeah. And I still have all my own problems. Yeah. And I still got stuff at home. I still got whatever it is. I have a life. Yep. It's not going to make it easy on me. So, man, that really does show. Well, that should tell you something when you're offering overtime and people don't want to come into work. Ugh. When when you when it's surpassed, money no longer is a is a motivator. It should be a good weather vane for you know, for leaders to look. Money's at only a motivator for like so long. Month? Yeah, that's it. When you're going, hey, uh, you know, you, here's double time to come in, and you're still like, nah, not worth it. Yeah, you know, doesn't matter. You've seen the ebb and flow of that in many organizations. Yes. Yeah. Where, where yeah. you get beat up. Like, cool, you can't, that carrot doesn't taste good anymore. No. 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 I believe that at a, at a global level, in the fire service specifically, based on the research that I just conducted, that we are in the midst of burnout. And things are probably going to get worse before they get better. I've, and, and, and we have a lot of incredible individuals all over the world who are trying to figure out what are the next steps to mental health. So I really believe that we are standing on the shoulders of the giants who have come before us and we are at this pivotal moment within the fire service. So Dr. Lori Moore Merrill, 
the United States Fire Administrator. She sat down with me. We dove into my research, um, had an amazing conversation. And a comment that she had made was that we are currently stuck in awareness. So to use her own terms, how do we now move into the operational and technical side of the health of our firefighters, right? We see departments where they have mandatory, not just physical testing, but you have to exercise every day. It's mandatory. Mm -hmm. You have a choice. You have to do it. Why? Look at our job. It's training. Right? Yep. You can't look say no to going to training. Look, look <laughs> at the job that we do. And so it's like, how do we flip the switch? How do we start to think, act, and train differently? Remove our selfish egos from part of the equation, you know, of like, oh, let's just get rid of our physical tests because promotions are coming up and I want to get into that chief's position or the captain's position or whatever. And I don't. I, I don't think I can pass that physical test. So let's put a vote out there to remove. We've seen it. I've seen it yeah. firsthand. You know, um, it's an absolute. It's a fucking joke. Mm -hmm. It's an absolute joke when it comes. Like, look at the job that we do. You don't have many professional athletes who are playing at the professional level that say, "No, coach, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to train today. I'm not coming to practice. I don't need. I'll just show up to games." Say, get the fuck out of here then. Yeah, that Alan thing. Iverson. I was going to say, yep. AI did it, yep. but there's one <laughs> Alan Iverson. There, That's right. In Alan yeah. Iverson. Yeah. I need to hit the gym. <laughs> yeah. But, right. Right. Look at the best teams. Who Do you know what I mean? And how do we shift into these? And so one of the things that came up for us, right, if we looked at tools and strategies that departments are using around the world, it was how do you treat your fire department like a professional sports team? So it came from two different avenues. One uh, was... <laughs> a department hired uh, an ex uh, coach from the NFL, some kind of assistant trainer. And he took one look at the department and said, man, like why are your firefighters off for so long? You got firefighters off with physical injury, waiting six months on average to get an MRI from their state medical system. Thousand dollars a day to have your firefighter off on leave in this state. It was a cost of thousand dollars to the clinic down the street to get an MRI, send them there tomorrow. Then we can start the rehabilitation process. They'll be back on the trucks sooner than the six month window. And the focus will become on rehabilitating them so that we can prevent that injury from happening again in the future. This department on your modified duties, they have their own in-house clinic and you do three to four hours of rehabilitation four days a week on shift for modified duties. They got firefighters coming from all over the state to come work at this fire department. Because they're so taking they care of them. It's yeah. crazy. If you they take flip, care of the switch. You give me resources, get out of the way, give me, you know, the expectations and let me go. I'm probably going to do you proud. And that goes and for yeah. so many firefighters. So many. They've drastically reduced their costs. Not zero, but they're not a lot of their overtime backfilling right insurance payouts because everything happens in house now they have their own in house clinic right. where firefighters and then that spills over into all other areas of health right firefighters they start to adopt these things now they have a neurofeedback specialist they just brought in i'm pretty sure they just brought in a um he's like a mind performance coach an ex marine or, or or navy seal or something of that manner right on on staff they have an md on staff wow. athletic therapist physiotherapist all all these things you know and they used to spend that 3 million dollars in the back end now they've invested it and they spend it on the front end for more of a rehabilitation and preventative measure, you know? And would you um, say that the payoff is as exponential as the costs were? Meaning that before, you know, when you have a person off and then you got the overtime, then you got all this lost time work, you have this massive exponential cost that's building a building. Whereas if you invest it, not only do you have less overtime, now you have engaged employees that are giving back to the system and now a part of it we're going to come up with the next big idea to help your department and your community. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, we don't have the research behind it fully, sure. like specifically. However, yeah, no, I would agree with that, that, yeah, make the investments, however they look, whether it's financially, whether it's time, whether it's through yeah. whatever. And, um, and you're going to see the payout. And I think the issue, part of the issue when like we looked at that lack of understanding and acceptance of mental health is like, we need to understand time, right? Like, Things take time. So like I said, right, like we we do need to wake up to what we are and aren't doing to the health of our firefighters. Like things aren't good. And 
we are way further ahead than what we were three years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Like both of those things are happening. It's like heaven and hell existing in the same plane. Like they both exist. They're both real. And it's, you know, it's just perception. Like how are you choosing to look at it? Because how we choose to look at our fire departments, well, we'll, we'll see it. It will be reflected back at us. If we think everyone's cheating the system and we try to control our sick time because they're all a bunch of crooks uh, stealing the, the city's money, then that's the attitude that's going to come out. Yeah. And like a part of that's true. You know what I mean? Like I get it. A part of it's true. People game the system, but like you're never going to stop. You're that. never going to ungame it. Yes. No, that's I mean, right. So we're and so the more enemy. we try and yeah, the more we try and like reprimand people and put all these things in place, like it 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 it, it manages it for a little bit of time. Yeah, a couple but weeks like, the rule kicked in and then you figure right. out a way around it and then that's there's right. this yeah. how it and then a new chief comes in place and they don't care so much about it as the last one did and then things go back to normal they change a little bit but they like something else or don't like it <laughs> but I, I, <laughs> I, I, I would almost guarantee you if, if you've got the employees that you're taking care of there's less of the gamesmanship yeah yeah. You know what I'm saying? It, totally. You're 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 always going to have those one or well, two. You also got guys like me and you, and it, we'll, we'll hold people in check too. Like, no man, he does. You know, like, no, that's not what they're trying to do. You yeah. know, you can, we're calling each other out, and sometimes we need that. Like, nah, you're right. And well, there's also like there needs to be a deeper understanding for firefighters. Like, I've gained a lot of awareness as a firefighter about the roles of administrating administrators. Right, I'm not an administrator. There is a lot of pressure coming from a lot of angles. And so some chiefs are just like, uh, like my father-in-law was a platoon chief, um, just spent 42 years in the service. And he was like, you know, as soon as you put a white shirt on, you become an asshole. Someone's right. not going to, someone's yeah. not going to agree with you. And like some of these things that come down the pipeline, they're not coming from anyone in the fire service. Right. And so like, this also came from Dr. Lori. Like we also need leaders within to stand up and be like, no. I think we've all seen I'm not, it. I'm not, I'm not doing that. We see it, right? Yeah. We see it in some cases. In other cases, like, oh my God, my job might be actually be on the line. I'm not protected by the union anymore because I'm in an administrative role. That looks different for different places, obviously. Sure. Um, and so, you know, at what lengths are we going to? I'm not an administrator. I'm not a chief. I've never put my neck on the line for that. I left the fire department to help firefighters. I love my job as a firefighter. Right? I would go back to it a hundred percent, I would go back to it in any given moment. However, right now, this is just a thing that's aligned for me in my life with the decisions that we made. Um, and it came from just knowing a place in my heart of like, I think I need, I think I need to do this right now. The stars seem to be aligning. And so there are examples of a lot of chiefs who have said, well, this might be it for me, but screw you. This is what we're doing. And so how do we do that? You know, this, it depends on the situation, depends on the circumstances. Or if I can't do that, what else can I do? How creative can I get with my leadership, with my team, with my initiatives, with the things we're trying to implement? So it might just look a little bit different, but actually be the same thing. I, I don't know. You know what I mean? Like how creative can we get opposed to being like, ah, we tried and they said no. So we're just going to do the exact same thing we've been doing, hoping for a different result. Right. That's the definition of insanity, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, man, that's a lot. That's a lot to take in there. So based on all of that, what would you say to frontline leaders and those policymakers, the people that turn that dial can actually make a decision on this? What do you say to them to best support their the behavioral and mental health of their personnel? I would say like as a leader, based on what I saw that you need to learn to face your own humility and and get comfortable with your own vulnerabilities because those two things alone will shift your perspective on yourself, on the way you think, on the way you act, on the way you react. And I, th I really believe, you know, the more vulnerable we become, that happens through facing our own humilities, um, that our hearts expand and that we learn to, and when our hearts expand, we we connect with other people's hearts on on levels that we just didn't before and so we start putting humanity in front for the good of humanity for the good of the people who are here um and then the deeper we dive into that you know we start to say yes to things and then we start to say no to other things that aren't aligned with humanity because our health is 
our humanity, the healthier we are on all fronts, physical, emotional, spiritual, mental, psychological, uh, relationship health, all of our, our health. It's such a massive thing, right? And so we learn to face those things about us um, and we see we see others differently because we learn to see ourselves differently and it changes our perspective opposed to saying, oh, look at Johnny and calls him sick every Saturday. I got to get this guy. Well, maybe you, what you didn't know about Johnny was that maybe he was going to AA meetings and he was suffering from alcohol abuse. Maybe he has a really sick child that he hasn't shared with anybody because he doesn't know how to deal with it. Maybe, you know, there's, there's always something that isn't on the surface that we are never going to know right? We're not going to know all those things, right? Maybe he's an alcoholic uh, because he was beaten and physically or sexually abused as a six-year-old boy that you're never going to know about. And it's not up to you to know about it. So how can we think differently about each other, about ourselves to move forward? So face your own vulnerabilities, get real comfortable being uncomfortable. We're good at it in a fire, but how good are, it? are we at it internally? And then if we can learn, so one of the most powerful tools that we saw for improving the mental health of firefighters is storytelling. Because when I share a piece of my story, you share a piece of your story. The more comfortable we get with vulnerability, the better we are at facing our humility, the more open we are to sharing our stories. And the more open we are to share our stories, the more contagious it becomes. And the more people start to look at their own life a little bit differently based on what those around us are doing are saying how they're acting how they're reacting all of those things yeah the oral tradition of the fire service is one of the most human things that goes back so far we share experiences absolutely and i think that you know the fire service and and just first responders in general where we're at today was built on that oral tradition of passing down those little tidbits, those little nuggets, those what little experiences, for? and those experiences that other people have experienced have probably kept generations past that safe from not doing the same thing that they did. You know, you know, when you're up on a roof and it's smoky, don't walk, crawl, because you might go off the edge. Just a small nugget like that. And, and yeah. there's no reason why we can't, like you talked about the storytelling portion of it, have that oral tradition of passing down, just like you talked about your experiences, my experiences, Jeff's experiences of this is what I went through. This is what I saw. This is what I dealt with. This is how it, it made it better because yeah. those conversations, those are the ones that are going not just today or tomorrow, but those are the ones that are going to build that base that down the road, firefighters, paramedics, cops, dispatchers, 20 years from now are going to gain a better life with better outcomes because of the stories that we're telling today, because that oral tradition is going to be passed out. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and I think that's why, and, and everybody's afraid to talk about it. They're afraid to be vulnerable. They're afraid to have that humility that, that the scariest thing is to open yourself up there. I don't think there's a scarier thing in this world is to allow yourself to be vulnerable. And especially, I would say, in the first responder community, because we have to put that armor on. When you go I to work, we, we think we do. You know what I mean? And it's hard to allow ourselves to do that. And I think once we start doing that and we start becoming human and you look at each other in that manner, that's where it's the game changer that you, that you were talking about. And I think yeah. it just needs to start happening. We we need and I think I honestly I really think it is you know like it, it is it's, it's happening changing. right little, it's, it's little by little yeah, yeah. It, it's, well we're it, taking it, it from awareness coming. to operations that's what I feel like yeah. we're in right now we're in yeah. that growth stage as an industry it's not just fire it's all the frontline workers we're all looking at each yeah. other going yeah it's time yeah <laughs> you know I mean in the right. past five years I I would say the last five years I've seen is the explosion of yes going sure you, yep. It's, it seems like, yeah, we all collectively, like, I would say after it, COVID, COVID burnt. It's a benefit. It's a benefit of COVID for sure. COVID burnt. I don't care. Brought it all to surface. It burnt us all. What it was. It, yep. it burnt yep. us all out. So we were all on that level playing field of completely burned out. Yeah. And yep. I think 
it really did do that. It burnt everybody out to the point where they just, they didn't realize they were burnt out at the time. No. We're starting to see it now. Yep. We're starting to see effects of it now. Yeah. But that burnout, we all kind of got on that level playing field and went, holy shit. Okay, we're all we're all kind of at the bottom of the barrel right now. Let's yeah. what we got to do to climb out of this thing. You know what I mean? And yep. and it's it's I think that's why the past five years it's really it made it okay to talk about mental health. COVID. It made it, it, made it okay. a necessity. Yes, it made yeah. that. It, that was the. Well, it, maybe it was like a a way for everybody. Okay, since this big thing happened, I can use it as not an excuse, but a reason to yeah. to to let it out because everybody's just like, all right, we've had enough. Yeah, because we all want to jump all on the bandwagon, sharing. right? Yeah, right. we That's all what we do firefighters too, man. We love the oh, what are you doing now? You're into that. I'm gonna get into that. Yeah. Totally. But, yeah. but we all shared the same experience. Yeah. Whereas before your experience with trauma was different from mine, from sure. Somebody yeah. else. But this your on a, BS was different than my yeah, BS. But on a I'm, global yeah. level, we all shared this same experience. Yeah. We all shared that isolation. We all shared all that. Yeah. And and I think that's what made it kind of okay is that that was okay to talk about because we all experienced it together. Absolutely. You know? Yep. Well, to guide us through more of those experiences, tell everybody about your website, all your stuff, where can they get information about your study? How can they learn more, get you to talk with them? Yep. Yeah. You can find us at firetolight.org. There's all the information about what we do from our research to our programs and coaching, all that kind of stuff. You can get in contact, contact with us there. Uh, you can hit me up personally at brandon at firetolight.org. That's my personal email. So just hit me up on Instagram. We are firetolight underscore firefighters. Uh, so follow along wherever you can. Um, yeah. Any questions uh, in response to anything that we've said, any curiosities, want to get your hands on the report, just reach out in any of those capacities. And um, yeah, we're happy to happy to chat further. Yeah. Anybody listening to this, that's a leader, especially please reach out to them and get your hands on this document because it's worth reading and at least getting uh, it's very eye text. Somebody did all the work. You might as well yes. benefit from reading the thing. <laughs> yes, that's, that's right. That's right. Yeah, no, we're, it's been, it's been amazing. It's been eye opening. Um, we're getting a lot of incredible feedback just, you know, with, from, from chiefs that we've interviewed from all over the world. So yeah, we want to get it out there. We want it in your hands. Um, hopefully it, makes you think a little bit differently about some aspect uh, uh, of what you're doing within your fire hall. Well, it's a good investment of your time to check it out. Yes. Pun intended. Yes. All right. Thank you very much, Brandon. Have Thank a great you. day, sir. Thank you for joining us on the Minds on the Frontline podcast. We hope everyone enjoyed this episode. We have more great content coming out soon. Please check us out on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook, and make sure to like and subscribe to all Minds on the Frontline podcast social media channels. Thank you for listening to the Minds on the Frontline podcast. Have a great day.